Remain standing for the sermon. <laughs> morning, everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> Every Sunday, uh, we have a goal, and our goal is to glorify God in everything that we do. And as a preacher, I have another goal, to impart the Word of God to you. But when I try to impart the God, Word of God to you, I'm trying to do it in a way that shows you truly who your God is, who, who your Savior is, and leaves you here uplifted and ready to face the week, feeling like you're strong enough to, to get through your week and live for God. Uh, so hope, I guess, is what I'm saying. I, I want you to leave here with hope in your heart. Uh, most of my sermons, I, I'll be honest, I don't know about this sermon. don't know if it's going to accomplish that goal. Because what we're talking about today is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And what we're specifically going to look at is the physical punishment that he endured throughout that entire process. Have you ever wondered why, why it was so brutal? Why he had to suffer so much? Because, because what he went through wasn't a typical crucifixion. It wasn't what every other crucified person went through. There, there were some added things in there. You know, Jesus on the cross, he was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. That's, that's what he did. That's, that's the role he played by being, becoming the sacrifice for our sins. Uh, he took on the punishment of the guilty so that we, the, the guilty, could be washed and cleansed and treated like we're innocent. But if that were it, if it were just his death, if he were filling the role, just like, think about those sacrificial lambs. We sang about it earlier. Those sacrificial lambs, which for centuries the Jews had sacrificed. Blood was spilled. Uh, the animal died. But they didn't brutalize the poor thing, right? It was clinical. They slit its throat. They didn't, they didn't beat it. They didn't torture it. They, they just slit its throat. Uh, and, and the blood flowed. And, and it, all of those sacrifices were looking forward to this sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, why was it so agonizing? Why was what Jesus went through so brutal? And I'm going to tell you right now, and remember this, because this is the, kind of the whole theme of the sermon. If you don't get this, none of the rest is going to make sense. The brutality of the cross and all the things leading up to it, that all happened so that we could see the true and ugly face of sin. That's what that's about. I'll say that again. The, the brutality of the crucifixion and everything leading up to it was so that we could see the true and ugly face of sin. Because honestly, most of the time, we don't see the true and ugly face of sin. Because the face that sin presents us isn't ugly at all, is it? If it was, we wouldn't have anything to do with it ever. But the face that, that sin presents us is always attractive it's always alluring. Its message is always, hey, you can get what you want. You can indulge your desire. And it's free. No strings attached. That's, that's, a, that's a lie. Underneath, there's this hideous interior when it comes to sin. Underneath, there's always, always a price to be paid. So we're going to look at what Jesus endured. Turn to Matthew 27, where we'll start today. Start in verse 20. Let me ask you this. Could you raise your hand if you ever saw that movie, The Passion of the Christ? Okay. Then that throws into sharp relief uh, what, what I'm talking about today. I saw it one time, and it was when I was on the mission field in Peru. And you know how when you watched it here in America, it gave the English dub of it, right? Because they were speaking in Aramaic in the movie, but you got the English dub. I didn't get that. They just played it, and I just, I, I, I was kind of familiar with the story, so I could, you know, go along with it, but I think I kind of got to see that movie the way Mel Gibson intended, the director intended it to be seen, uh, without completely understanding every word spoken, but if, that, I, I left that, that auditorium feeling bad, and no, no, that's not true, I got to the end of that movie feeling horrible, seeing everything Jesus went through, 
until the resurrection scene at the very end. Do you remember that? The light coming through and the, the tomb. And I needed, that, I needed that resurrection by the end of that movie. I'm not giving you that resurrection today. Matthew 27. We're, we're getting to, that'll be later. Start in verse 20. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. He was not. I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Verse 26 is what I'm going to linger on today. Just, just one little phrase in there. Scourged Jesus. What he did was hand Jesus over to be scourged. Uh, a scourge is, is a whip, but not like the whip that we think about. Uh, it's, it's not for popping. It's for, it's for destroying a person's body. When Jesus underwent this scourging, the man who did it was called a lictor. That's his technical name. And the scourging itself was designed, it, what it was going to do is speed up the death of the victim but exponentially magnify the anguish that the victim would go through. The lictor, the guy who's doing it, you can kind of see him there. Uh, he was a professional torturer. His job was to inflict as much pain as possible without letting his victim die. That was it. Anguish, agony. He wanted to inflict that without letting the person die. Uh, can you imagine having that job? It was a brutal thing. I, I, I cannot imagine how calloused and hard a person's heart would have been to be able to do that. Um, what he used, this is the scourge right there. See on the ends of that whip, it would have had like, I think, several kind of leather pieces coming off of the handle. And at the end of each of those would have been a, bit, a sharp bit of metal or a bit of bone. And so he didn't, whoosh, that's not what this is going for. He raked that scourge across the back of his victim. So Jesus would have been brought in and, and stripped and tied to a post. And then, and with every lash, it would have ripped the skin and muscle off of his back. I'm not saying this to be gratuitous. I'm saying this to illustrate how ugly and lethal sin is. Blood would have been flying. Flesh would have been flying by the end of it you would have seen exposed muscle if not exposed bone next that wasn't the end of it by the way that was pretty commonplace the scourging happened quite a bit that, that was nothing new the next part is maybe unique to jesus look at verse 27 then the soldiers of the governor took jesus into the governor's quarters uh, headquarters that would have been the praetorium they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed on his right hand, in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him in the head. This was different. Not every crucifixion person who endured crucifixion would have endured this. They drag Jesus to the praetorium. They pull out the whole, but it says battalion, that's a cohort. Talked about that a few weeks ago. That's at least 480 men, maybe, maybe up to 600. Hundreds of guys crowd in the praetorium to see this man suffer. What they do is interesting. They put the crown of thorns on his head. Uh, that, that'd be enough for me. Forget the scourging of the crucifixion, that'd be enough. Uh, these, these thorns would have been wicked and long and sharp. Jam that on his head and let the blood flow. They put that robe on him and a reed in his hand. And what, what those things represented 
was a mockery of royalty. Because that's what a king wears. A crown, a robe, and a scepter in his hand. It, those were emblems of kingship, of command, of authority. And they're putting them on Jesus. And, and then they're bowing down to him, mocking him. Hail, king of the Jews. And I think that's why they're doing all this. The charge against Jesus, brought against Jesus, was that he claimed to be a king. And, the C and Caesar brooked uh, no rival. The emperor would not put up with anybody else claiming kingship, authority, rulership. And this lit a fire in those soldiers. The fact that this nobody could claim to be a king, and worse, that he was Jewish. Because the Jewish people were not good subjects of the Roman Empire. They were always causing problems. They were always fomenting rebellion. They always wanted to break free from the yoke of, of the Roman Empire. There were trouble all the time. If you were a Roman soldier, that wasn't the best place to be sent. If you were a Roman governor, you did not want that assignment unless you were willing to crush a lot of people under your heel. So these soldiers were incensed, not only that a nobody, a commoner, uh, but a Jewish man would claim to be king. They took all their bile and rage and poured it out on him. In a way, they were, they were close to right. This, uh, by the way, this is bestial, right? This is like a pack of wild animals taunting their prey, picking at their prey. Crown of thorns, the robe, the reed, which is just a stick or a staff. Then they take him and beat him with the, on the head with, the, with that, that staff. Rip him again, send him on his way. This is, this is more than just physical abuse. They're trying to humiliate him to the deepest level possible. Now they almost had it right. They had the emblems right except for the mockery. Look, turn to 1 Timothy uh, <clears throat> 6. 1 Timothy 6. Had they but known who was really standing in front before them. 1 Timothy 6, we'll start in verse 13. Here's what Paul says about Jesus. I charge you in the presence of God, and he's talking to Timothy here. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. And listen to this. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see to him, be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. That's what Paul thought about Jesus. See, and we, we fall for appearances so often. Those soldiers just saw, saw an upstart Jewish guy who needed to be put in his place and killed. Paul saw him for who he really is. The king, but not just the king, the king of kings. The Lord of lords. And, and that crown and that robe and that scepter uh, that were meant to mock him, the crown of thorns and the reed that was used to beat him, those would one day be, <coughs> excuse me, one day be replaced with true uh, emblems of royalty. Let's finish this out. John 19. I'm just going to read this through. Start in verse 16. Speaking of Pilate here. So he delivered him, Jesus, over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic and Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather the man said, I am king of the Jews. 
Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. So when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross were, uh, of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, and to fulfill the scripture, or, uh, said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine, wine uh, stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Sin is ugly. Sin is deadly. Sin killed God's son. He was innocent, holy, good, and sin killed him. My sin put him there. Your sin put him there. Too often we want to sanitize the cross. Look at this picture. I think this is interesting. That is some nuns. Uh, they've taken down a crucifix, I guess, from the cathedral, and they put it on the steps, and they're, they're washing it clean. Too often when we think of the cross, we want to sanitize it. We want to take all the blood off of it. We want to make it presentable, or at least bearable. But it's none of those things. The, the, the cross that Jesus was nailed to was bloody, and splintered in a cruel instrument of torture. There's no way we can sanitize it. But we try to in our heads. Because what we're trying to do is think less of our sin. We, we want to think, yeah, I've sinned, but, but maybe not that bad. But look, the crucifixion was horrible. It was gruesome. We think about the people who got Jesus to that cross. Think about it, the, the Jewish leaders who lied about Jesus to get him there. Pilate, who claimed to be innocent, but wasn't. He knew Jesus was innocent, still sent him to the cross. The soldiers who scourged him, the soldiers who mocked him, the soldiers who spat upon him and beat him, the ones who nailed his hands and feet to that cross, we want to think they're the bad ones. But the truth is, we are no less guilty than they are. Our sin put him there. The ugliness of our sin put him there. And only his love kept him there. Look at this picture. This is from, not actually from the movie, Passion of the Christ. That's a, the director, Mel Gibson, on one side and the actor portraying Jesus, Jim Caviezel, on the other. It's just kind of weird to see that. I'm sure Mel's explaining, okay, go do this scene. or I'm not sure what he's doing as a director. But to see Jesus sitting, it looks like Jesus, right? Crown of thorns, blood. Next time you're having a conversation with Jesus, you're having that little talk with Jesus, picture him like this. Because we can never, ever forget the price he paid to save us. We can't, we can't forget that crown of thorns. We can't forget the scourging and the beating. And when we do that, we have to remember just how ugly and lethal sin is. Sin is deadly because it killed the Son of God. Sin is ugly. You can see it in the scars on his back and the wounds on his head and uh, the nail prints in his hands and his feet. Sin is deadly because it killed the Son of God. So listen to me. If you are indulging in pride, if you're flirting with lust, 
If you're feeding your greed, now's the time to stop it. Listen, if you're giving free reign in your life to gluttony or vanity or jealousy or rage or drunkenness or envy, if you are letting those things control your life, now's the time to give it up. Because listen, we get way too comfortable with the very thing that killed Jesus. We get way too at ease around sin. We want to gloss things over and pretend like they're not that big a deal. But you and I need to remember the ugly face of sin. We need to see it for what it is. And if you've fallen for any of those lies uh, that, that sin is not that big a deal, or it's not that ugly, or it's not that deadly... If you're starting to think those things just aren't quite that bad, look at Jesus on the cross. Look at the price he paid. And then you need to repent, turn your back on those things, turn to Jesus Christ, and be healed. That's where I'm going to stop today. You may need to struggle with some things this week in prayer. You may need to let Jesus confront some of those things in your life. But if right here and right now, you want to be washed and purified of those sins, you can do it. We're here for repentance. We're here for baptism. We're here for faithfulness. If you need to do any of those things, please come forward while we stand and sing.